19 times. If we are, are we up still? I'm watching a thing back there. I guess. There we go. Take it down to about the fourth point there, sir. Thank you. It occurs 19 times in the New Testament. And in the King James, it's translated, and let's look at these. Fellowship, it's translated fellowship 11 times. It's translated communion four times. And it's translated contribution or distribution two times. And finally, it's translated communicate or communication two times. Now, we're going to pause there in this particular uh, PowerPoint because I have some other things I want to share with you. <clears throat> the most important thing that we can have as a church is the presence of Christ. How many agree with that? If the presence of Christ is not here, we might as well be an Elks Club or a uh, 4-H group or something. You know, uh, that's what separates the church away from all other meetings is the presence of Christ. So having the presence of Christ is extremely important. Whatever guarantees the presence of Christ is important. Uh, go with me to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. I want to begin reading in verse 15. This is not on the PowerPoint, but it's very germane to our discussion today. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Is that, is that pretty simple? Does everybody understand that instruction? Somebody does you wrong, treat you wrong, what does the Lord tell you to do first? Go privately to him just between you and him alone. Entreat him. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. But if he does not listen... Take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So, don't just leave it unresolved. Please don't take two or three people on your side. The point here is not to find out how you're treated wrong. It's to witness how you approach him and how he responds. Okay? In fact, you ought to choose some mature brothers or sisters to go with you. One or two. Because here we're, we're looking at, at a case. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. That's the first step that most people want to do. Tell it to the church. Or at least to the telephone, right? In fact, I've gone to some prayer meetings where that's what they were doing, is telling it to the church. But lastly, he says, you, you tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. That's a really strange instruction, Tim. Here are two people with broken fellowship. It's broken in this case because somebody has done wrong to somebody else. Okay, they follow the process to resolve it. How do you resolve interpersonal problems in the church? First of all, side by side, one on one. Before you tell anybody else, you tell that person. You seek reconciliation. If they refuse, then you take witnesses. If they refuse, then the whole church appeals to the brother. If he refuses to hear the whole church, then he's acting like a sinner, so you treat him that way. In other words, don't leave it unresolved. Bring it to a resolution. Now, it's in that context 
that he says, verse 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you realize that there are things that need to be bound up and there are things that you need to have loosed? How many need some money loosed? Okay. How many are not liars? How many have, have difficulties in your family or in your neighborhood that needs to be bound? The works of the enemy that need to be bound. See, binding and loosing is to be the activity of the church. <clears throat> now, he says this in the context of dealing with these problems. So, whatever you bind. Now, the word you here, it's really uh, difficult in the English. Because in the English, our word you is both singular and plural, right? In fact, the singular you uses a plural verb. Is that bouncing off the walls? Did I miss you? We don't say you is, do we? We say you are, you were. Whether we're talking plural or singular, we use that. So we have difficulty knowing whether or not this verse is talking to us singularly or plurally. So we have to go back to the original language. And the original language, you don't have that because they've got a, a different word for singular and plural. In the old English, we did too. If you're reading, how many have read King James Bible? Any of you read that? How many ran across the word ye? Ye. That's the old English plural you. That's the word really that's here. Whatever ye bind. Binding and loosing is an activity of the collective church. It's what we do together. So whatever ye bind is bound and whatever ye loose is loosed. Again, I say to you, if any two of you agree, everyone say agree. agree. Yeah. Any two or three of you agree. Some people only has agreements with one. That was meant to be funny. <laughs> there is really no agreement with just one person, right? You have to have at least two people for the word agreement to be operative. If two or three of you agree about on earth, about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three, if any two agree, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now notice, we got a division we start with. Someone is sinned against somebody, right? The fellowship is divided between them. Now, this person is to seek to restore the fellowship, all the way to the church until the church determines that one person refuses to be reconciled. Then they're to treat him like he's acting, like a sinner, like a non-believer, okay? Then he says, if you together bind something, it's going to be bound. If you together Loose something, it'll be loosed. Why? Because when two agree on earth about anything they ask, it shall be done. Do you believe this? this now, by the way, in your Bible, how many find these are in the red letters? What does that mean? These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says... If any two of you agree. 
about anything on earth. <clears throat> when you ask, it'll be done. Now, either that's the truth or it's a lie. And I don't think Jesus tells lies. So he then says that when you are gathered together in my name, I'm among you. Now, look at this word agree here. I wish I had put it on the PowerPoint, but I didn't have time this morning. This is from the Greek word, sumphaneo. Uh, the Greek word is a combination of two words, sum and phaneo. How many still know what an old phonograph wa it was? Does anyone here know? How many still have one? <laughs> they don't even make platters anymore, do they? Yeah. Why did they call it a phonograph? How many have one of these? You know what that is? How many know what that is? It's a phone, right? Where did that word come from? It came from this word, phoneo. And the Greek word phoneo means to sound. But the little preposition attached to it is sum, and it means with. To sound with or to sound together. And when they brought that word into the English, symphoneo came into English as the English word symphony. How many know what a symphony is? How many's ever gone to a symphony? I went to one one time. The curtain was down. And all of a sudden, it sounded like a barnyard. All of the noises. It was just, you know... Boy, you're just making terrible noise. I said, man, I've wasted, we've wasted money. Until the curtain came up and the guy in the little black tail, you remember? He has that little white stick. And he came out and he tapped it, tick, tick, and uh, silence. Then when he lifted his hands and that orchestra began to play, it was the most awesome sound, Right? How was that possible? Well, before the curtain went up, they were tuning their instruments. That's why there was no agreement. Everybody was doing their own thing. And that's how many churches actually sound all the time. Because everybody's just tuning up. But when they had a master conductor who took a score written by a master and each one had their own score that was designed for the instrument they played so that it would harmonize with all the other instruments. And they played them together. There was this awesome sound. If any two of you sound together, you can ask what you will. Why? Why? Because where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. Who answers prayer? Who does the work? The Lord does, doesn't he? That's why agreement or unity is the number one project for the church. We've got to protect that above everything else. Because that's where Jesus is. Agreement is not about each individual decision. A husband and a wife can live in agreement and not always agree about everything, right? I found out very early in my marriage that if my wife was not happy with her hair, I wouldn't be happy. So I quit telling her how to fix it. Do you understand that? Yeah. What color goes on the window treatments? I don't care. I don't have to agree about that. My wife and I often have something we disagree about, but we're walking in agreement. Are you understanding something I'm saying to you here? It's possible 
to be together in agreement in a church and have a minor disagreements, okay? As human beings, that's, that's something we have. Our agreement is about the goal, where we're going, what we're trying to accomplish. That's the agreement. That's what makes us walk together. So this is an agreement in which people walk together in koinonia or in communion, which is a joyful and desirable fellowship. There are no selfish divisions in this type of fellowship. This is a communion where members work hard at keeping the dirt out of the fellowship. Are you, uh, how many, if I talked about the foot washing that took place in the upper room by Jesus, how many would be for me with that? You would know about that. You recall that Jesus took the towel. This is John 13. And that he went to each one of them. You recall that? Why was he washing feet and not washing hands? Or washing heads? Why didn't he wash their heads? How did they get to that meeting, by the way? They walked. When they walk, what do they wear? Yeah, probably sandals. Open toes. Openings to the feet. When you walk on the dirt in sandals, what happens to your feet? You have to get dirt on them, right? Now, they didn't wash hands because they didn't walk on their hands. It was the part of the person that touched the earth that they had to cleanse, right? So when Jesus came to Peter, and Peter said, <laughs> you're not washing my feet because you're the master and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just a disciple. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, we're not going to be partners, right? And so Peter said, well, if that's the case, give me a bath. And Jesus said, no, all of you have had a bath. You only need the feet. In other words, you need to wash the part that gets dirty. And as we live life together, there's something that all of us touch that, uh, that has potential for becoming dirty. Right? And what Jesus was teaching, if you want to keep the partnership, you've got to be, you've got to be committed to washing the dirt out. So when Jesus came to Peter and he said, you can't wash my feet. Jesus is as it's saying, if I don't wash your feet, we, we can't get the thing out that divides us. We can't take out of our life the thing that breaks our agreement, breaks our communion. So he says to them, what I'm doing, you don't know. And they could have said, well, Lord, now wait a minute, wait a minute. You've got a basin, you got water, and you got a towel. It's pretty simple. I know what you're doing. No, you don't know what I'm doing. But you're going to be blessed if you do it. So what he is teaching about was not the physical water and the physical towel. It wasn't the physical washing of feet that the blessing's in. It was in the principle he's talking. Are you committed to making sure the koinonia is clean and pure and that you're walking together. Because if we walk together, what does Jesus say will happen when we meet together? He will be present. That's, that's the critical reason. Now, all through the history of the church, the church has been concerned about that. And it shows up most in the communion. The word communion here, uh, there is another word that the church uses for when you take the Lord's Supper. It is called the Eucharist. How many have heard that word? If you're a Catholic in background, you know that, right? The Eucharist. It's a good Greek term, eukaristu, which means literally, I thank you. 
Eucharisto is the thanksgiving. When Jesus took the bread and broke it, he did what? He gave thanks. So they became known as the thanksgiving. I, I thank you, the Eucharist. Well, the Roman Catholic Church says we're going to guarantee the presence of Christ is here because we're going to take the elements of the Eucharist and we're going to transform them supernaturally into the literal body and blood of Christ, right? That's a big word that describes that called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is the conversion of one substance into another. When Luther came along, he broke away from the Catholic Church, and he says, no, we have the presence of Jesus, not because the, the bread and the, and the wine turns literally into the body and the blood of Christ. We have it because Christ is with his substance is with these elements. That's called consubstantiation. You should understand that, particularly if you are a Spanish speaker. What is the Spanish preposition con mean? What does that mean? With. So chili con carne? Chili with beans, right? Con. Consubstantiation. The substance of Christ is with these elements. <clears throat> I prefer the term substantiation because Jesus taught that he is present in the koinonia. See, the koinonia is the communion of the body of Christ. It's the communion of the body of Christ. Two other words I want to just talk briefly about, or one other word rather, Excommunication. What does that mean? It means to exclude a person from by either a decree or an edict, a person from membership or from participation in the group. So it literally means to remove someone from the communion. In the Roman Catholic Church, it means you cannot come to the Mass and celebrate the Eucharist. Because when a person is removed from the communion, they're literally removed from the fellowship. Is everybody following what I'm talking about? Now, we've had a history of a long history of a problem with communion. You know, people who thought, I read that verse, if anyone eat or drink of, the, of this unworthily, right? And so somebody said, well, I'm just not going to take for fear I'll be taking it unworthily. The problem with that is when I refuse to celebrate the communion, I'm announcing that I'm excommunicated. I'm removed from the communion. If I refuse to share it with you, I'm excommunicating you. You, you follow me? Because communion is meant to be a, a symbol in which we test the agreement. We're really testing the state of the agreement that's between us. Is everybody okay now? Everybody still here with me? Let me, get, let me catch up with my notes now. <laughs> I feel like Paul Harvey, page three. Let's go to that next slide there, my brother. Let me see if we're, are you on slide three? Okay, good. Communion is a connection between people. Okay, we're talking about having a connection between people. Everyone knows when the connection is broken. Hello? Watch this. These are broken connections. 
right? All of that's about a communion in the house that is broken. You don't have to tell anybody when it's broken. Is that right, Brother Bruce? You, have you been married long enough now? You know about that? <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be married real long before you find out about the connection. See, go to the next slide. Communion is a connection or a partnership between people. So, so we're talking about the difference between the little cup and the bread and what it actually represents. What does it actually represent? It represents the communion. It represents something that happens between people, a connection between people that you know when it's there and you know when it's not there, whether you can define it or not or whether you can articulate it or not. You know that. It is a partnership or a connection. Whatever breaks that connection destroys the partnership. When the connection is broken, people do not feel like walking together. You ever had someone that injured you and it was unresolved and the next time you saw them on the street, you crossed the street so you didn't walk on the same side? The partnership is broken. The elements of the communion table, then, are nothing but symbols of the connection. Is that okay? Can, can I say it that way? Is it understandable? When I take that cup and when I take that little piece of bread, there's nothing mystical about it, but it is highly symbolic of what's happening between us. Okay? A broken partnership means... One lies, he's telling a lie when he takes the communion. If I have a broken, a broken relationship, say with Brother Bruce here, I've really done something to injure him, and we're not even talking anymore, or, or we got these bad, this bad connection now, and we're together and we're taking the communion, I lift up that cup to my lips, I'm saying by taking the cup, everything's all right between us which is a lie. You under you catching that. So a broken partnership means that when I take communion and I take the symbol that everything's okay, I'm lying. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to go to this passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 27 through 32. I'm reading from the English Standard Version here. Verse 27, each of these verses will come up separately. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. Or in light of this, you need to examine yourself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now we're talking about the symbols, aren't we? For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now I want to just say something here about the body. The body he's talking about here is not the body of Christ hanging on the cross. It's the body of Christ that's sitting right here. Look around you. Do you understand this is the body of Christ? As well as that one that's, that's on the throne? So when I eat or drink improperly, it's because I have failed to discern the body of Christ. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Yeah. 
Is it possible they can have that kind of consequences? A failure to consider the communion, the koinonia, could have very serious consequences, he says. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. I don't, and that sounds a little strange, so let's go to the next verse, see if we can understand it. And, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Hmm. Let's go to the next slide there. So what does it mean to drink in an, un an, un an unworthy way? And become guilty of the blood of the Lord. Well, first of all, he said, we're to examine ourselves about this. So partaking without discerning the body of the Lord brings judgment upon oneself. Uh, the unworthiness here refers to if I've got broken fellowship. If, if the fellowship you and I enjoy is truly based on the work of Jesus in shedding his blood, when I refuse to deal with the problem, I'm denying the blood that did it. So he says, you're to judge yourself. Well, what do you judge? What do you examine yourself? You look at the state of the communion. That is, husbands and wives need to think about whether they're the, what is the state of their communion. Every one of us in the body of Christ need to think about what is it. We need to think about that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Brother Bruce is really giving me a problem. I, I, you know. Before I take of this, I, I need to judge whether or not I need to do something to restore that. Because if I don't, if I don't judge myself and I fail to discern Brother Bruce is part of the body of Christ, I'm treating him like he's not part of the body of Christ because I'm not wanting to reconcile with him, right? The consequences of failing to do that is going to be consequences on me. First of all, weakness, which refers to either moral or spiritual weakness. I'll have struggle overcoming moral issues. I'll struggle overcoming spiritual issues because I failed to understand the importance there. Secondly, physical sickness. Thirdly, he said, some of you have died. You've died physically. There's been a funeral for some of you. Because this thing's eaten the core of you out. This bitterness has destroyed you. So I want to, want to make sure that I am in the process of examining. So next slide there. Who gets to examine? Who gets to do this? The individual. This means to correctly access my... Uh, connections. I want to always judge my connections. Have you ever had a battery that wouldn't start a car and then you found out something was wrong with the connection? It was corroded and it wasn't making good contact, right? Then he says you need to examine the connection between yourself and your brothers in the body. So when I judge myself, I'm correctly assessing my connection to you. That's why God puts us in individual bodies. It's real easy to relate to a church in Corpus Christi today. Because we don't know anybody. We don't have any problems with anybody. Right? It's much more difficult to work with the people here in the living word. Because we, we know that. The closer you are to someone, the more evident their flaws become. Y'all been married 50 years, right? Does he have any, does he have any flaws? 
I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the connection is maintained by not, not failing to observe flaws, but to, to look beyond them. Right? Now, my wife and I have two daughters. Both are now in their 40s. But when they were young and teenagers, we were traveling a lot. And I used to say, because we had a motor home that we traveled in, we did a lot of ministry on the road, and I said, man, it's tough living in the bedroom of three women. <laughs> I mean, when you're that close, boy, you know, people get on your nerves, right? Uh, all those kind of things that happen. But one of the things that we do in close relationships is choose to ignore the weaknesses. We don't focus on them. That's how we maintain respect for one another, is that we do not choose to focus on them. So we, we can assess ourselves. If we don't, the Lord will uh, do the judging, the assessing. You see, when one does not assess himself, and when one does not judge himself, it defaults to the Lord. Well, I'm not going to take communion because I don't want to judge. <laughs> That just means you said, okay, Lord, you judge me. I refuse to judge myself. You judge me. And the Lord will not ignore it because he loves you too much. The consequence is his judgments are, are to correct us. He has a, a correction. And he does that by turning up the heat on us. Okay. I used to watch uh, Emeril Lagasse on the Food Channel. Uh, I liked it, and he would talk about, and he'd take that, that knob off of the stove, and he said, now this, this knob is so you can control the heat, heat, you know. So if you got a pot on the stove and, and you turn up the heat, what happens? Yeah, it gets hotter, it boils, right? So we'll go to the next slide here, slide eight. The Lord examines by turning up the heat. He brings, he brings the grease to the top so it can be removed. So I got a little pot of chili here. I'm trying, I don't know whether you can see. Can you see that? Does that show up? Because when you turn heat on chili, what happens? The fat melts and it comes up to the top is grease, so you got to spoon that off, right? Because if you don't and you let it get cold, what's, gonna, what's it going to look like? God assumes that if you can see it, you'll do something about it. So if you're not doing something about it, it's because you can't see it. And the reason you can't see it is you had not got it hot enough yet. So God said, okay, let's see if you're going to do something about it. Let's turn up the heat. Okay, there's it coming up. You still won't do it. Okay, we're going to turn it up. He'll just keep turning it up until finally it gets so hot that you have to do something. One way or another. See? That's what default means. Now, he says, judge yourself so I don't have to judge you. Because I, I, will, I will make sure that it takes it. He's not going to escape. Failing to take the elements of the communion does not cause you to escape the judgment. Okay. So when we come together to take communion, it primarily is our opportunity to judge what is my, the state of my communion with you. What about my connection with you? Is there, is there something corroding the, correct, uh, the connection? Is there dirt in the relationship I've never gone to you to wash out. I need to do that. I need to do that. Are, are you following that? We're going to the last slide here. Remember, examine yourself. When you've examined yourself, make a decision. I'm going to do something about this. Put a timetable to it. Make an appointment. Do something that forces you to resolve the problem that's breaking the fellowship. 
We don't like doing that because it puts a lot of pressure on us. The Lord makes it easy. Go to him privately. Don't go broadcast this thing. Just go deal with it. Why? We want the church to be walking in agreement so the presence of Christ is here so that while we're together, we're very effective in binding and loosing. That's what we as the church do. Commit yourself to taking care of it. Begin to give thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And then partake of the elements. Any questions here today? Okay, Brother Bruce, since I picked on you, you're going to pick on me now, right? You have one, one thing to do, and that is to seek to resolve the connection, although there is no body of Christ connection there. They're not part of the body of Christ, are they? I would, you know, the, as much as you can, the Scripture says, live at peace with all men. You have no ultimate control over it. You have only control over your part. Right? Right? When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so we just seek to please the Lord. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Amen. Because we're going to we're going to take communion here. Yes. I think so in our marriage. We want to make sure that connection is, is maintained. We want, to, we want to practice whatever it takes to maintain that. So I think Matthew 18 is a good scripture to know how to follow to resolution. Amen? Yes, sir. Is there what? Yielding? Oh, healing. Oh, of course, there's always healing in the presence of Christ. That's part of the binding and loosing process, isn't it? Yes, sir. I guess we can, uh, if you want to, we'll go ahead and get ready here. Uh, I don't know how you want to do this. I'm going to put it in your hands, my friend. Yes, sir. Well, I, you know, I think we do it a lot of ways. Sometimes we're not even conscious we're doing it. We pray together. It's, uh, you know, when we're praying together, we're asking God to do things about taking care of situations or problems. And that's... To me, that's, that is what binding and loosing is. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, what about children taking a communion? I think all children ought to take care of communion, and I base that on Remember, the Lord's table is the outgrowth of the uh, Passover meal. And the Passover meal was designed especially for children. When they ask, you know, what do these things represent? You're to say in the Passover meal, we were, we were slaves in Egypt, but the Lord delivered us. So the communion is a wonderful time for children to learn about the work of Christ and about our relationship to one another in the body of Christ. I do not believe in a closed communion. There's nothing, there's nothing um, magic about these elements, is there? I once had a, uh, a, men's a men's retreat in the woods, took a bunch of men to the woods, 
And, uh, you know, we were there just having a good time, but I decided we want to take communion. And the only thing we had to take communion with was orange soda water and, and crackers. Boy, it was a wonderful communion because the symbols only are that. They are a symbol. So there's nothing here. It's just a cracker. This cracker's burned a little bit, but it's okay. But it's what it symbolizes that's important, see. So when I come together and I take this, this little piece of bread in the form of a cracker here, it represents the body of Christ. First of all, the body that was broken for us by Jesus' body. But it represents each one of you as well, right? It's a, it's a broken fragment. It's a part Sometimes I like to just take communion with a big old loaf of bread and come up and break it out. I like to just break it and give it to the head of the household, whether it's a father or mother, and say, you take it now and break it to your children so you can explain to them what we're doing. Just break it out. When Jesus instituted this meal, uh, pardon me one minute, I need to go back to a slide here. I want to go back to that. Uh, passage. Well, I'm not going to do it that way. <clears throat> Let me get my Bible up here on my phone. Isn't that cool? Have a Bible on your phone. First uh, Corinthians 11:23. Uh, they took this uh, Passover meal. They had four cups of wine that they used during the Passover meal. And in one of them was the cup of supper, and it was probably the cup that Jesus used. They, they sopped bread into the bitter herbs and took that, and he transformed it. And, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. His broken body makes a whole body down here, right? And I say that I don't sense there's a lot of broken relationship in in fact, uh, I know the pastor's heart. I know what's going on. He asked me to teach expressly on this, but uh, I, I don't sense in my spirit there's a lot of broken, broken things here. I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I don't, I don't get that sense in the spirit. And don't say this because something is wrong or teach this because something is wrong. I teach this because it's something we have to always give attention to and learn to maintain it. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and he gives thanks. Now, in the Jewish culture, every prayer they pray is, first of all, a thanksgiving. The way the Jewish people prayed would be they would bless the Lord. They didn't bless themselves or one another. They blessed the Lord. They would say something like, we bless you, Lord God, King of the universe. Because you have provided bread for the sore. In other words, it becomes a thanksgiving. And, and, Jesus, and then Paul says, you should pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. So we look at this and we say, Lord I, I'm asking myself right now, would you please bring to my mind any broken relationships or broken connections I have, first of all, within this body and within my family? So that's, that's the first thing we're examining myself. If, I, if the Lord brings something to my mind, I've got to do two things. Decide I'm going to do something about it and make a commitment, schedule it, to do something. If it's possible to do something right now, then we're going to wait a minute and let you get up and go do something about it. Okay? Thank you, Father. Now, what he says here in 1 Corinthians was that the same night in which he was betrayed, 
the very night someone did him the worst in the world. When he had given thanks, he broke the bread. Lord God, our King, we want to bless you for providing the body and the blood of Jesus to make a body here. We want to thank you for that. And so we give thanks. Thank you, O oh Lord, that we can have clear connections between one another. And so we partake of the bread together. Our connection <clears throat> is not based on whether we agree on everything about, about Christ, is it? It's not based on whether or not we all agree about the doctrine. What we agree is the basis of our relationship is symbolized right here. It was the blood that Jesus spilled. It's not based on our color. It's not based on our, our economic conditions. It's not based on any of that. It's based on the provision of the blood. I don't have to know anything about you except that you're a believer and that you're that because of what Jesus did. Could you just stand right now a moment and turn around to one another? And I want you to say to one another, I'm connected to you because of the blood of Jesus. <laughs> oh, Lord, <laughs> we thank you for the provision of the blood. How freeing it is, oh, God. It's freedom. It's freedom. Let's take it together. <clears throat> Isn't it great to be a part of a fellowship where people are committed to maintaining the connection? Praise God. Praise. Amen. Amen. I don't know who dismisses the group, but that's all I got to say. Thank you so, so much, so much. We will not forget what we've learned here today. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord God. We bless the tithes and the offerings, Lord God. May you multiply them onto Living Word Church and onto your people, Lord God. Father, we bless you for the word, Father. Let it go with us today. Let us continue to meditate on the meat of the word, Lord. The scriptures speak for themselves, dear God, but with new understanding now, Lord. We thank you for loving us so much that you would bring us the depth of this word, my God. That every time we take communion, every time we do.